Okay, hello everyone. Uh, so, we're going to start our second session now. And our first speaker is... Uh, just a second. Our first speaker is Ryan Froze from DePaul University. Ryan is a PhD candidate at DePaul. His interests include 18th and 19th century German philosophy, metaphysics, and normativity. And he is writing a dissertation on modality and method in Hegel's logic. Ryan's talk today is entitled Actuality and the Idea of the Good. Ryan, please. Thank you very much, Achilles. It's great to be here today. Um, nice to see some familiar faces. Uh, I have fond memories of attending the conference in person uh, in 2019 uh, and often say it was the best conference that I uh, got to be a part of. So uh, I'm excited for the first day today. Uh, and I'll, I'll be, my paper today is called Actuality and the Idea of the Good. So I'll give a, a reading of the uh, last part of the chapter on cognition and the idea of the good. Spanning about five pages, the penultimate section of the science of logic the idea of the good, is one of the briefest in the entire text. In this confined space, Hegel outlines a logical account of the good, argues for the unity between the practical and theoretical idea, and then defines the absolute idea itself, which is the culmination of the entire work, in terms of the identity between the theoretical and the practical. Part of this unity, and the source of much controversy, involves Hegel's claim that the good is not merely some goal, that may or may not be realized on the basis of some, some striving, but that the good is realized, um, that the good is realized. It is these sorts of features of Hegel's thought that have led to charges of conservatism and quietism against Hegel, and that these charges are demonstrated ostensibly, not only in Hegel's real philosophy, but grounded in his logic and metaphysics. Although Hegel elsewhere, elsewhere says that the world is not how it ought to be, for example, in paragraph six, uh, or the remark to paragraph six in the encyclopedia. The central question I wish to address in this, in this paper is whether Hegel's account of the good in this crucial part of the logic can both demonstrate that the good is realized, is accomplished in some sense, and that the world is not how it ought to be. Below, I argue that Hegel makes this possible by demonstrating how the good must not be thought simply as an ought, as a purpose that may or may not be realized, but as an activity that operates on the basis of its own actualization. And I'm using there uh, a bit of uh, Richard Winfield's uh, formulations that he uses in some places. It is in this way that we can say that the good is realized or actualized, but not in the sense of any and every determinate ought being accomplished. I outline, I outline this in three parts. First, I outline the initial shape of the good as an actual that stands over and against an actual. This results in seeing the good both as self-determining and thus as absolute, but also as finite because it opposes itself to the external world. Second, the good realizes itself in the external world, but remains an ought, that is a finite purpose that may or may not be realized, uh, and it limits itself from being realized. Third, the good is shown to be what something is in its truth, the very activity of self-determination and manifestation. In short, the self-actualization activity of the concept. It is this final stage of the good that demonstrates why Hegel can claim that the good is realized and yet avoid claiming that the world is how it ought to be. Although we do not have the space to give an adequate summary of the preceding section, the idea of the true, we should note that the account of the good begins with a reversal from where the true began. In the preceding section, the true was taken to be outside of the subject. The subject sought to apprehend and conceptualize the truth in the world and beyond itself in various ways, but this involved seeing the world as true or containing truth and itself, the subject, as striving after that truth. The idea of the good is the opposite of this structure in the sense that now the subject contains the good and takes itself to possess the true and the world to be lacking in truth. This means that the good is wholly self-determining and therefore not determined by anything external to it. That is, the world does not impose itself onto the good. Hegel calls the good absolute for this reason, simply because it is non-relative. 
The good status as self-determining and absolute means that it is in opposition to the world that it confronts. Hegel writes that, quote, it is, an, it is as actual that the good stands over and against the actual, end quote. But in truth, the good takes itself to be actual and the world to be, quote, non-actual or a nullity. This is an instance where actuality for Hegel cannot be mere existence, for it is precisely the good as non-existence or unrealized, which is here taken to be actual, whereas the world, the realm of existence, is that which is not actual. The good is so certain of itself initially that it only takes the world to be indifferent and hostile to its own aims. Even in realizing a particular end, the good does not gain any actuality. Kant's example of the sincere friend fits the picture here. Duty does not ask whether or not sincere friends have ever existed or ever will exist. Such empirical facts have no bearing on the duty to be a sincere friend. The good initially does not get its validity from the world. However, the good is not merely this absoluteness or non-relativity. The good also is also the demand for its own realization. Here we see that external actuality, an actuality that realizes itself, is still a moment of the good. This is but another outcome of the good's status as self-determining. In order for it to determine itself, it must realize itself, must produce itself in actuality. The, get, the good then demands its own externality and cannot remain a merely abstract purpose. Although the good presupposes its superiority to external actuality, it also cannot be fully self-determining unless it determines itself in actuality, unless it, in Hegel's words, attains external being. The drive to realize itself also underlies the second quality of the good. It is finite. The tension now is not just between the good and the world, but within the good itself, since we have, uh, I'm sorry, I'll start that sentence over. The tension now is not just between the good and the world, but within the good in itself, since we have something like a finite absolute. And Hegel makes it clear that the good is finite, both in the sense of being severed off from the external world, and also because the good, in its attempt to realize itself, is but, quote, a certain particular purpose. End quote. In determining itself, the good particularizes itself as limited and therefore finite. Or the good is finite because various purposes count as good, and it is in and through a particular will that the good is realized. Thus, what the good realizes is never itself as universal, but as particular. Hence, the good's actuality renders it particular and finite. But this particularity limits the good from being realized. Because the good presupposes itself as opposed to the external world, it is non-relative and therefore finite. And because it is finite, it remains susceptible to being blocked by the world that it took to be a nullity. The good now, due to nothing other than its status as absolute, quote, cannot escape the fate of finitude, end quote. The good's finite manifests itself in various ways. Because the realized, the, or sorry, the good's finitude manifests itself in various ways. Because the realized good is only so as an external existence, it is only, quote, a contingent, destructible being, ein zufälliges, zerstörbares Dasein, end quote. That is, the realized good is susceptible to the hostile world in a way that the unrealized good is not. Moreover, the destruction of any particular realization of the good can be brought about not only because of the external contingency and evil of the world, in Hegel's, uh, Hegel calls it external contingency and evil, but also because the good is a plurality of goods, each of which can compete with the others to be realized. Thus, the good can be blocked by the world and by the good itself. Given these obstacles, the good can be rendered impossible. And Hegel concludes, quote, the good thus remains an ought, end quote. Because it is susceptible to its own destruction, the good is nothing more than an aim that may or may not be realized, nothing more than a formal possibility whose realization will be determined by actuality and not a good that is truly self-determining. However, 
All of this is revised once the absoluteness of the good is reconsidered. It is the good as fully realized in some pure will that causes it to become finite, restricted, and an impossibility. Hegel writes, quote, it is the will, therefore, that alone stands in the way of attaining its goal, because it separates itself from cognition, and because for it, external actuality does not receive the form of a true existence, end quote. Clearly, the presupposition that the will and the world are in opposition to one another will be undermined by the end of his discussion on the good. But we should also note that the issue here is the will itself not the world. In particular, it is in its assumption, in the will's assumption, that external actuality cannot be true, that the will stands in its own way of being realized. The end result will not simply be a recognition that the will depends on the world. Such a structure would belong to an essence logic of relativity. Rather, the will must see itself as the sole determiner, uh, must uh, must see itself as not the sole determiner of what is good, and that the realized good is true, even independent of the will. This will have to do with the concept of determining what counts as good and true, and seeing the good as an activity, not simply an ought. Hegel makes a remarkably swift move to arrive at the realization of the good. Going back to the, or referencing the syllogism of external purposiveness, which he discusses earlier in the doctrine of the concept, he writes that we have two moments or premises in the movement of the good. And we've uh, already discussed these a bit. First, the good opposes itself to the world. The good is an absolute. And second, the good uses the world both as a means and a realization for its purpose. Hegel then claims that all that, quote, remains, to it, or remains is to bring together the two thoughts, sorry, the thoughts of the two premises of the practical idea, end quote. His point seems to be that the good's absoluteness as severed from reality cannot stand, since it is not merely its own validity, but also the impulse to realize itself, that is, to be realized in and through external actuality. But because it is realizing nothing other than itself. It is an activity that works on the basis of already having been realized. And because reality can indeed be altered to the ends of the good, despite the fact that reality can also block the good from being realized, what we get when the good externalizes itself is something truly objective and something truly self-determining, absolute, and non-relative. That is, the good is no longer dependent upon even a will to realize it. Instead, the will strives to realize what is already to some degree actual. However, we will be left with either a banal point that instances of the good can be realized, but they are just as fragile as any other purpose, or something wildly implausible that the good is realized in some stronger sense, approaching the claim that the world is how it ought to be, if we do not focus on Hegel's emphasis of the good as an activity. Um, so he writes, quote, the activity produces only a one-sided being for itself, and its product, therefore, appears as something subjective and singular. And the first presupposition is consequently repeated in it. But this activity is, in truth, just as much the positing of the implicit identity of the objective concept and the immediate actuality. Of course, uh, end quote. Of course, everything comes down to how exactly we have an identity uh, between the good, the objective concept, and immediate actuality. The first step in recognizing how this identity is formed is by thinking about the good not as an ought, not as a finite purpose or a goal, but as an activity. Hegel thinks that at this fairly minimal and formal account, we can see that there is an activity that undergirds any ought, or that the ought is grounded on the good as an activity that is already realized. It is this activity that Hegel means uh, by the realized good. Hegel's example of a political state, which he offers not in this section, but at the beginning of the section uh, on the idea is instructive here. A state is measured by its own internal norm, its own concept, uh, but is also the striving to be that norm, 
a state that does not live up to its norm, Hegel thinks, should be called an untrue state, whereas a state that lives up to its norm, uh, to the norm of a state, is a true state. However, Hegel also claims, quote, even the worst state, one whose reality least corresponds to the concept, insofar as it still has concrete existence, is yet idea, end quote. The claim here is that a state is essentially seeking to live up to its own concept, that is, striving to be a good state. But a good state is nothing more than what a state, in fact, is in its truth, since its concept is inherent to what it is. And in order to strive after this end, there must already be the realization of a state. Moreover, it is in striving to be a state that the state shows that it has realized the concept of a state to some degree, that its concept has gained existence, or in Hegel's phrasing, that the concept has given itself actuality. That is, although the worst state fails at being a proper state or a true state, insofar as it, ex insofar as it exists as a state, it must also be the striving to live up to its norm. The good begins as nothing other than this striving to realize itself, and this activity is still at hand, and the good is nothing more than this activity. This self-actualizing activity cannot be without its own self-externalization. Hegel here is not endorsing anything that exi uh, is not endorsing everything that exists as good, but it seems to me that he is saying that the good must exist to some extent. Hegel's realized good is simply the reality of this striving, not the full accomplishment of something's concept. Indeed, in being this striving, something must both be realized and never fully accomplished. It is in this way that Hegel can say that a state is the activity to realize its norm, and even in failing to live up to itself, it does not cancel out the realization of its concept entirely. A state has still realized its concept insofar as it exists, and fails at being a state, whereas my pencil cannot even be considered for this worst state designation. Moreover, to whatever degree the concept of state is realized, it does this in and through existing states. Thus, we see that the good becomes not just an inner actuality, but an external one. The world is not a nullity, but where the activity of the good exists. Clearly, then, Hegel is not saying that every ought is realized. The worst state is not how it ought to be. At the same time, however, he can say that it is striving to realize its own norm, whether it recognizes this or not, and therefore the good counts as realized. Hence, we now have the good as an activity which engenders particular oughts and allows us to make sense of Hegel's claims that the good is realized and that the world is not how it ought to be. The good generates the ought, we might say, but the ought does not produce the good. The realized good does not give us anything like the fulfillment of each and every particular ought. Rather, it merely shows that it is uh, the process that is realized, that has realized itself, um, and allows for any striving after any particular ought to take place. So, in conclusion, Hegel's good is not merely an ought. Rather, we have seen that it is an activity that operates on the basis of its own realization. Hegel can, can thus say that the good is realized and that the world is not how it ought to be, since Hegel's realized good is an activity that grounds each ought, but does not entail that every singular ought will be fulfilled. What exists can and obviously does fail to live up to its concept, fails to be true, and thus Hegel need not be committed to anything like the full realization of every ought. But Hegel's logical account of the good also demonstrates that something in failing to live up to what it ought to be must also already be the realization of its concept. Um, uh, as Hegel puts it in, an, in another part of the remark to paragraph six in the encyclopedia, the idea, quote, is not so impotent that it only ought to be actual, end quote. The good, as a crucial moment of the idea, should also not be thought of merely as, merely as an ought, but as actual. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Ryan. Um, our next talk is from Zihao Mao. Uh, Zihao is a PhD candidate at Warwick, currently working on Hegel's logic and philosophy of nature. 
is specifically interested in the philosophy of life and the French conception of Hegel. The house talk is entitled Hegel on the idea of life. So how, please. Okay, thank you very much. Um, can you hear me clearly? Yes, you can. Okay, thank you. Thank you for having me here. It's really a great pleasure to be able to discuss philosophy again with my dear fellows. Um, today I'm going to talk about Hegel's account of life as the idea and life in its natural form, namely as individual organic life. And the question I'm going to explore is what is the relationship between the logical idea of life and life as the determination of natural existence? Is the natural determination the result of an application of the logical idea to the natural givenness, or is the natural life a repetition or an analogy of the logical pro process manifested in nature itself? And how is the natural life and the logical idea of life related to each other and differentiated from each other? To be more specific, what does it mean for Hegel to claim that the concept has come into existence in the idea of the living individual? Is it potentially a reconciliation of the movement of pure thought and the category of natural existence? These are the questions I'm going to deal with in this talk. And I hope to demonstrate that the natural process does not imitate the seemingly corresponding logical process, not because of the so-called deficiency of nature, as if nature ought to be predetermined to conform to logic, but because of the distinctive relationship between individuality and universality as manifested in nature's own movement. However, such a distinctive relationship is not entirely alien to logic, not just given without reason, but rather has its prefiguration in the idea of life. That is, the natural life is still rational, not because it follows the logic, but because on its own accord, it exhibits a form of rationality which has its truthful explication in the law. So um, for a start, with the equivalence of means and the realization of end in teleology, the subjectivity and objectivity come together. What is subjective proves to be determinable by objectivity in itself, and the subjective is only realized in and through objectivity. The result falls neither on the subjective nor the objective side, but proves to be an immediate unity of subjectivity and objectivity. And this immediate outcome of the teleological process is called life the first form of idea. It is named as life because it is both the end, that which is always and already realized, and the means which perpetually engages itself in a process of self-realization. That is to say, life is in itself an incessant movement that continuously posits itself in its own development. It is therefore alive. Life is the first and foremost an individual because as a resulting unity from the teleological process, it is at once that which is in itself. And since it is alive, it is called a living individual. This is the moment where the concept comes into existence and thus the movement of the concept coincides with the movement of the ob objective or the real. Well, surely from the very beginning of the logic, it is always both the movement of thought and the movement of being. But here it is the first time thought as explicitly being concepts or subjectivity and being as explicitly real and the two are engaged in the same process. It is the coming together of that which is explicitly self-determined and that which is explicitly self-subsisting. Therefore, the meaning of the logic here becomes rather realistic. The living individual here seems to provide an application of the objective reality as a process of self-deployment of an identity which is brought forth in differences and at the same time unifies all the differences within itself and in this way proves itself to be an individuality that exists for itself, develops its own differences within itself and reunites with itself through those differences into a dynamic totality. This explication of the objective reality can well be taken as that of the natural life when Hegel comments in the encyclopedia that the concept is in nature, partly as an internal principle and partly as a living individual. This juxtaposition of the logical idea of life and the natural life 
seems even more apparent when Hegel talks about the organics in the third part of the philosophy of nature, where the organic is, is, is depicted as that which sustains itself as a concrete identity in the process of externalization marked by the sensibility or feeling, yet pertains its individuality in terms of the process of living. Here I quote Hegel in the section 337, where he concludes that the characteristic of organic individuality and this living process makes the natural life, the concept itself, exhibited in space and time. Then we conclude that the development of natural life is the adequate expression or imitation of the movement of the logical idea of life. If the natural life is the expression of life as the logical idea, then there remains a problem of how natural life is to be grasped as a rational object in itself. That is, according to which law is the natural life given as conformable to the logical idea. This is the unresolvable aporia when philosophy of nature is taken only as an application of logic to nature, because nature as given remains external to the concept in this manner. For Hegel, however, life is not outside of the concept, or here the logical idea, because as a self-deployment of an identity arising in its own differences and reuniting with itself through differences, the logical idea of life does have the structure of natural life. As Hegel comments in section 337, life can only be grasped speculatively because in life there is precisely the speculative, not expression, not application, but rather on its own account, speculative. In this sense, to quote the German, the natural life is rather as analogon, namely the analog of the logical idea. However, the natural life cannot be the duplication of the idea of life. Or rather, looking back on the science of logic, Hegel never ceases to insist on the unsurpassable difference between life as a logical determination and life as a natural existence, between the living individual as the first form of the idea and the organic as the form of natural being, or to be more precise, between life as an universal idea and life as an individual living being. The logical life, the living individual, is that which detonates the immediacy of the idea, bearing with both the purity and the inner necessity of the idea. Whereas the natural life in its immediacy detonates the idea, I quote, yeah, the idea projected into the externality of subsisting. Or to quote the German, in the Äußerlichkeit des Bestehens, King Ausgewolfen ist. Therefore, this immediacy of natural life, unlike the logical living individual, signifies, I quote, a sinking or immersing into the externality of nature. Therefore, even though it is quite true that in the philosophy of nature, life does partly take a form of the internal principle of nature, and the animal organics proves to be the highest form of the interiorization of the externality of nature, but still, what the natural life cannot get rid of is the irrationality of the externality of nature. So even for the consummating point, the animal organics, there is still a trace of externality that which manifests itself as not conformable to the corresponding logical idea. So here's the question. If the logical idea of life cannot be identical to the natural life, how should we understand the lengthy conceptual development between the two moments, the development which claims to be presuppositionalist and imminent? Does this asymmetry, this asymmetry between the logical and the natural life originate from or designate an irreconcilable gap between logic and nature? To answer this question, firstly, I'd like to point out the difference in the treatment of the two determinations of life. For the logical idea, it is the unity of subjectivity and objectivity in its truth. And since it is through and through self-determining, it is totally transparent to itself. The, and this is the luxury that the idea in nature cannot share. The idea in nature is internal only in the sense that it is always external to that which is truly internal, namely the logical idea. If Hegel is to maintain the strict imminence of the idea in nature, then he must accept both the imminent movement which brings forth the philosophy of nature 
and the downside, the imperfection of such an imminence, namely that it remains external to the logical. Or if you like, the idea of nature must be external so as to be imminent. Therefore, the immediacy of the life of the immediacy of the idea of life does consist, I quote, in the fact that the concept does not exist as such in life and that its presence is subject to the multiple conditions and circumstances of external nature. And in the organic nature, the concept emerges only as, I quote, a blind concept, not grasping itself. In short, the process in nature is confined in the realm of externality. This is even true for the most internal moment of natural externality, the animal organics. I hope that I have demonstrated, therefore, that the philosophy of nature cannot be the mere expression or application of logic, and natural life cannot be the simple repetition or resumption, restart of the logical idea of life. And thus, the philosophy of nature is not an effort to find in the empirical data the existing logical idea or structure. It's not a search for determinations of pure thought, but a disclosure of what nature itself proves to be. Consequently, when Hegel writes in the Encyclopedia Logic that for life in its immediacy, we have before us only the concept itself, the idea existing as a concept, immediate concept, this designates precisely the essential defect of life, namely that the subjectivity and objectivity or the concept and reality do not yet truly correspond to each other uh, as for the alive in its immediacy. And, and as will soon be shown in the logic of the idea of life itself, in the deployment of the threefold structure of living individual life process and genus, that there is in immediacy still a gap between life in its universality and life in its singularity or individuality as the living individual. And note that this does not imply any dualism between the concept and the being of life. As an idea per se, life, even in its immediacy, is already a concept with real content, or what is the same, a reality conformed to the concept. The gap lies in the fact that the real is still in the form of immediate being, which means life is yet inadequate to itself. And here I'd like to recall that the above discussion is about the difference between logical idea and the natural idea. And it is to respond to the question, how to understand what happens between the two distinct moments, the logical life and the natural life. After I just pointed out the difference between the way they work, I'd like to point out that um, there is no unsurpassable separation between the structures of the two determinations. Note that logic is not just a system of abstractions indifferent to other concrete sciences. Logic is not something opposed to the rich, concrete representations of the natural world. The aforementioned differences do not lead to a rigid opposition between logic and real sciences. Logic, in the Hegelian sense, promises to unveil the richness of the world rather than veil it. But the question is how? How to explain the discrepancy between the logical and natural life so as to free logic from the above accusations? It is close the reason why the influence of logic on other sciences is not just formal. One must explore in what sense logic is not confined just to itself, its content, not just a set of determinations of thinking. In the introduction to the doctrine of concept, Hegel indeed says that logic is a, I quote, formal science, which means logic should not contain the reality which belongs to the subsequent real sciences, or if you like it, special metaphysics. However, this in no way means that the logic is empty, but rather it is about content presented in its purity, or if you like, presented in its conceptual necessity. It presents, the logic presents the content in its absolute form. And what is meant by absolute form? It means it is the pure idea of truth, no matter what its feeling, its peculiarity, its particularity is. Therefore, the explication of the relation between logical and natural life must be built on the basis of a more general articulation of the relation between logic as general metaphysics and real sciences as special metaphysics. And here I'd like to explain a quote, a quote which seemingly contradicts what I just said, namely that Hegel does call philosophy of nature applied logic. Uh, 
Such a qualification rests on the fact that philosophy, na philosophy of nature deals with concrete knowing and being and develops forms of idea that are, well, if you excuse the expression, more real than those of logic. Yet this does not imply that the philosophy of nature relates to nature as immediately given, as a term applied or application on Vandung might indicate, but only that it consists in grasping its object in such forms that it has to know reality in its logical forms. It attempts to grasp the universal in the particular, the universality in the concrete phenomena in nature. And this is why philosophy of nature is called, I quote, a thinking or conceptual consideration of nature. It's therefore a matter of studying the idea in a more concrete or more natural figure. The logical idea is related to concrete knowledge as the base, the foundation. In this sense, there is no doubt that the logical process bears an ontological meaning since the truth of the concept possesses the power of disclosing the essentialities of the real. The source of this power is not extraneous, but rather granted by the very imminent logical process itself. And on this basis, we can say that the logical determination of the idea of life does provide the conceptual elements which make it possible to define the general characteristics of the natural life or the living organics in the philosophy of nature. Imminent as the idea in nature may be, may be, the logic nevertheless provides the language or rather the fundamental elements on which special metaphysics or real sciences can be built. So now the question becomes, whether the determination of life as an immediate idea, that is to say, the immediate identity of the concept and of the objectivity, can be of relevance for the establishment of the fundamental characteristics of the ontology of organic, physical organics, especially of animal organism, defined by Hegel as the complex totality, which is both subjective and objective, which is capable of developing from oneself its differences and assembling them within an identity and which bears an imminent relation of unification of differences, which is the negative unity relating to oneself, that is the animal organism. The conceptual framework expressed by the logical idea of life arises from the mediation and imminence of differences. It's therefore expected to be able to account for the living organics and the living organics as the emergence of subjectivity in nature and the movement, to be able to account for the movement which characterizes the process of natural life as the categories which exhibit both the strict immediacy and reciprocal externality, which is special to a philosophy of nature. And this actually amounts to a justification of the close relation between life in its immediacy and life in its universality because it is this relation that provides the foundation for us to understand the immediacy and externality present in the natural determination of life. As Hegel says here, I quote again, that life can only be grasped speculatively because in it precisely exists the speculative. And also that life is the resolution of all oppositions in general, because it is where the concept and the reality, the inside and the outside, the means and the end, the cause and the effect, the subjectivity and the objectivity are one and the same thing. Therefore, the life process or its self-sustaining activity cannot be defined as a transition into otherness, but as the conservation, the preservation, the reunification of what, come, what becomes other. The concept of life is for Hegel that by which he seeks to deploy the content of a concept as a unity of different concepts to think of the unity of a contradictory concept in itself. To say that life can only be grasped speculatively is to recognize that it is the process of a mediated immediacy, a process of appropriation of objectivity in the life process, which itself generates subjectivity. And this is where the animal organics will be exemplified as the natural version of such a life. The point I've been trying to make from the previous discussion is therefore that there is the structural link between the logical life and natural life. And that link provides the basis for the explanation for the application of the relation of the meaning of two determinations of life. 
The four organics, the third part of the philosophy of nature, corresponds to the doctrine of concept. And that is to say, in so far as the animal organics appears as the integration of differences within its relational unity or identity, an integration made possible by the emergence of the subjectivity within the living natural things, it is prefigured by the determination of subjectivity as it is in the realm of concept and logic. Even though natural life would never succeed in conforming to the concept and would therefore be different from the logical idea of life, but it is nevertheless structured by it. Thus, if we articulate the first process of the idea of life, which bears on the structure of the living individual and that of the philosophy of nature in the section on the animal organics, we can see quite clearly that the fundamental concepts which qualify the structure of the living organism are provided by the doctrine of the concept and that does allow Hegel to support the thesis of a specificity of knowledge of the organic natural being. To reiterate, with the background of the general relation between logic and philosophy of nature, we see that there is a close relation, or if you like, an affinity of meaning between the two determinations of life, the logical and the natural. However, such affinity does not eliminate the difference that pertains to them or rather in uh, Hegelian means, if you like, exactly because there are correspondences, that there is always a space for differences. To be more precise, the relation, the affinity, the correspondence can only be properly analyzed by engaging with the differences. That is, by distinguishing the logical expression and the subordination of natural processes to the necessity of the concept. Thus highlighting the indeterminacy and contingency in the word externality in natural reality. What is emphasized here is again, the difference between the logical idea of life and the form of the natural life. That is the living, but always singular immediate form of the universal life, universal form in the natural life. The living individual as qualified in the section on the animal organics of the philosophy of nature, activates or mobilizes, brings to life the logical determinations of finality or end, and subjectivity and totality, which together make the animal organics the culmination of externality, natu natural externality in a totality governed by an internal end, an inherent finality. Therefore, the characterization of the structure of living things is what seems to get rid of in nature the reciprocal externality as a mode of being of natural things exactly because it seems to actualize the dynamic process inherent to the idea of life. Here's the section of three, four, nine of the philosophy of nature explains the reason why the animal alone deserves to be called a true organism. Unlike the poorly differentiated unity of the plant, which grows on a superficial mode of an external addition, is poorly because of the lack of connection of differences in themselves. And contrary to that poorly differentiated identity, the animal has no parts, but members. The relation is not so much that between parts and whole, which is still quite external, but that between members and subjectivity. The subjectivity and members are the two terms which qualify the animal organic. Section 350 indicates that, I quote, the parts of the organics, the title, are essentially members and subjectivity exists as one and all pervading subjectivity at all, and organic individuality exists as subjectivity in so far as the externality proper to the natural figure is idealized in members and with respect to this process of externalization into members within the subjectivity. The organics maintains itself in the same identity which has a sense of itself. The sense organs or the sensibility which reflects from the externality back into itself. The organics therefore designates a mode of organization of living natural beings, which is distinguished from the whole by the aberration of elements or parts, which is quite external and different, indifferent to each other. And this mode of organization, this mode of a more organic organization rather, is to presuppose the totality by which the elements exist only starting from their relations ordered according to an imminent end, organized around an inherent finality. <laughs>
Note that for the totality of the logical concept, in as much as each of the moments of the concept is itself the whole concept and is posited as an inseparable unity with it, that is the, the logical concept. And the animal organism is therefore a differentiated or self differentiating identity, a subject which is within itself in its differences or which poses its differences as momentary of a single subject. And that really um, seemingly correspond to the logical concept. This is what accounts for the very term subjectivity. Indeed, what makes this unification of differences possible and effective in the form of uh, sensibility in nature, insofar as it is, I quote, re-interiorizing mediation of a singularity, which makes the animal not just a bag of organs, but an individuality, a unified identity. Such a uh, characterization of the organism allows Hegel to affirm the thesis of the specificity of the forms of knowledge of the organic being and conclude that the only external determinations are emphasis insufficient insofar as it is a question to know organic life in its truth. These conceptual elements also make it possible to provide, to provide a basis for a critique of any form of reductionism, which would consist, for example, in elevating certain determinations into absolute valid categories by only an assembling of parts into a whole. This is a critique of that. Um, I suddenly realize I may already uh, take quite a lot of time. Um, may I ask uh, how many time do I have? Uh, because I still have two pages, it might be too much. <laughs> uh, minutes, uh. Okay, all right. Uh, just uh, tell me to start whatever it, it, it you think is appropriate. All right, uh, I'll continue. So a, um, such a determination of the objectivity of living things may lead one to think, however, that there is an identity of natural life in a singular figure of the individual who lives, the identity of such a natural life and of the logical idea of life, or the former, the, idea, the natural life is the repetitive structure of the logical idea of life. The unity of the living being, which is the internal unity of subjectivity and objectivity, is then that of, of a harmonious unity, of an individuality which itself produces itself in a subjectivity, which is not for it only the immediate means of its relation to itself, not just immediate, but with a process. The living thus forms a totality which puts it at a distance from the inorganic world and makes it a being freed from all the inorganic, or uh, if you like, the pre-organic natural determinations and from all relations which belong to the sphere of inorganic nature. It uh, marks a distance from that inorganic nature. Section 352 and a remark in section 360 suggest a perfect independence of the living natural being with regard to the external environment where the notions of subjectivity and internal end express the idea of a subsistence by, by itself of the organic individuals. But there seems to be ultimately a resorption and intake of externality and an identity of subjectivity and objectivity, not only within the objectivity of the individual, um, but also in its relation to the external world a relation where finality or end is being precisely this interiorization of externality. This interpretation is based on the reading of the second moment of the life process in the science of logic. The life process is that by which the individual produces itself in its relation to the external world as a negative element of its otherness and thus achieves the true unity of the idea. This moment insists on um, in development of the individual, it, it insists on the, integra the integration of external objectivity. Here we recall the explication of the need, desire understood as self-determination or objectification of the self of the living individual, an effort for the organic, uh, natural organic beings, an effort in assimilation, which is the second moment of the organics in the philosophy of nature, and to nullify or engulf the otherness of the external world. It can be said briefly that in, in this effort, the, extern, the externality of objectivity and subjectivity seems to be superseded in the relation 
finality or end that links the living individual to the external world. It seems so. However, this does not make the living natural being an analog of the logical idea of life. It is not even the adequate expression of the logical idea. Indeed, if the philosophy of nature is an investigation of the structure of the real natural living individual, the emergence of natural subjectivity and individuality from their other, it never ceases to show their specification in the natural life. And to pay attention to the links of the individualization or singularization in the organic life, and consequently to show that the development of the real individual does not follow that of the logical process. It does not follow it. And that the subjectivity and objectivity do not exist as such in nature. Thus, it is remarkable that to quote section 337, which defines the living as organic individuality or existing idea, recalls at the same time that natural life sees this individuality endlessly threatened with sinking or immersing into a chemical process, which predominates in death and disease, and that the living beings are perpetually exposed to danger and violence and that in their relation to the external world, the individual is not for them this victory over external objectivity. It cannot um, escape that. In other words, the philosophy of nature is very attentive to the obstructions, the danger to the sinking or the immersing to, or the fall of the universal determinations in the immediacy of natural singularity and the contingency. So I hope on this point, we will see that the science of logic provides the conceptual elements for considering the limitation of the, of the idea of life in the figure of the living individual in nature. And this difference between natural life and the universal idea of life operates therefore at the two levels. One is the individual and the other is its relationship with the external world. So for the individual part, if externality seems to be well conjured at the level of the living organics, the latter nonetheless remains only the immediate unity of his concept and objectivity or subjectivity and objectivity or the internal unity uh, of both. In science of logic, living individual is defined as a subjective and objective totality in the form of the singularity. The philosophy of nature shows the concrete implications of this logical determination. Its subjectivity in the philosophy of nature is natural, and that is to say, it is only rudimentary, it is only fragile, it is open to all kinds of danger, insofar as it is a differentiation of the self, which is not by itself, or which does not has that objective being. It is not thought of as such, not as subjectivity as such, and that is to say, it is only based on the feeling of self, the sensibility. And that sensibility, and which is quite different from subjectivity as such, can never get rid of the trace of externality. And that's why it is always exposed to danger and violence. And this aspect of organic life, therefore, remains only temporary and immediate. And for the second level, the uh, relationship uh, of the natural life with the external world, the science of logic indicates that the life process is an attempt to reduce the gap or asymmetry between life in its universality and the living singularity or individuality and to make the individual not only an internal unity of subjectivity and objectivity, but also the real unity without with the external objectivity. However, uh, sorry, is there a problem? Oh, oh. Oh, that, oh, I just saw the two minutes, uh, uh, three minutes ago. <laughs> Sorry about that. And so, uh, yeah, um, I would just uh, briefly conclude that, um, well, um, the, uh, the, the problem between the uh, uh, logical idea of life and the natural idea of life uh, will um, show to be, um, well, and what the problem with the natural life will prove to be an absence of the imminent relation between the universal and the particular. And the final development of philosophy of nature, uh, which is uh, finalized in the animal world, it's far from representing a rational element of the organization as in the logical concept, 
which exemplifies a perfect unification of universality and individuality. The animal world, the consummating point of nature, is rather what cannot be confined to the forms determined by the concept, thus cannot be reduced to a mere analog or expression of the logical idea. As, and that's it. Uh, I'm really sorry for uh, uh, taking so much time. Thank you very much. Uh, it's fine. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, now we're going to have the Q&A for both talks. So raise your hands and I'll make a note. And, uh, okay, so uh, Amanda. Um, I have a question for Ryan. So first of all, thank you very much for your very interesting talk. And um, I have a question that actually has to be to do probably more with my personal struggle with the Eagles account of the good, but uh, I hope that you're, uh, I, 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 you know, I want to hear your opinion about that. So uh, I will try to be very brief. Um, so if we, um, if, if the good for Hegel um, must be realized in, to some extent in the objective world, and if you assume, of course, that uh, Hegel's uh, discussion of the idea of the good in the logic uh, has not to be with uh, some you know, separate word, what, but uh, with uh, the, the word that he describes then in the real philosophy. So we have to conclude probably that, and that's my question actually, that um, the good has to be uh, actualized in the, in the realm of nature too. And uh, if so, I want to, you know, and it's, I have always have problems to understand in what form this happens, because uh, it's probably quite easy to understand the, the, the good, the realization of the good in the, in the, the social practices within you know, the realm of the spirit. But when it comes to nature, it can, can be quite hard to frame this problem. So. Uh, I'm curious about your opinion about that. Thank you. Uh, thank, thanks very much for your question. Um, I, yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, and so I, I'm not sure. So I think if we are to, to read this as, as, um, as I did and as, as you summarized nicely, um, that there, that in some ways, like the realization of the good cannot mean that it just remains this unrealized inner, that it has to, in some sense, um, involve an actualiz actualization in the external world. Like your question about whether that has to also include nature um, is interesting because um, I'm not sure if it has to, in what way it ha nature has to be included in this. So if, if we take the example of of the uh, concept of freedom, um, it might be the case that for Hegel there will, I mean, it seems to me that the, for Hegel there's going to be a, you know, a higher form of freedom in the social and political world, uh, in human life, um, and the institutions that it can enact and enable freedom than in nature. Uh, and on the other hand, there will be a kind of self-determination in nature. Um, and so it's not as if there's uh, no form of self-determination in nature, but I would say it it, it, it doesn't seem right to me that they're of equal status. Um, so I, I, like, I think this does bring some problems. Um, and, and one of the things I want to avoid is making this reading too deflationary. And so if, if there's something unsatisfying with saying maybe that um, freedom only exists in nature in this you know, limited way but that does seem to be how i read uh hegel um talking about this this particular uh concept or this particular norm um yeah and it also seems like the i mean if if the good as i as i tried to outline is uh inherent to what something is then i think you can have an account of the good in nature that you know to reference is a house talk a bit or some of the examples that that he was talking about like the plant is just going to have its own norm or concept and so we should not be measuring you know the plants good if you like the plant self-determination to what goes on 
you know, in human life or something like that. Um, so I think you will have, you will still have a realization of the good, but it will be, it will be different. I don't know if that's um, satisfying, but that's, that's how I begin to think about it. Um, and and I, re I really do appreciate you bringing in uh, nature here, because I sort of, um, I don't discuss these differences between, say, nature and, and the political or social spheres when I, when I you know, refer to this, this actual world. Just enough, the, the way you frame the, 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 the problem, I think it's, uh, we are on the, the, the same side of the problem, and I think that uh, you answered in some way of my question, so thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Uh, next question is from Karen. Yeah, um, actually, I have um, a question that's a bit over there. Oh. So, first, um, to Ryan, thanks a lot for your talk, too. This is rather a clarificatory question. So, I like your focus on the good as activity, and you said something like that the good as activity generates the art and not the other way around. But if that's true, and um, when I wonder, okay, if good is an activity, then it's also purposive, right? And then there must be some inherent normativity to it or in it. And then maybe you can't separate the art and the normative activity um, in the way you're doing it. Uh, you, so because it's a purposive activity, you cannot separate the art and this activity? Yeah, that's what I thought of. Yeah, so so I think I mean I don't want to separate them, but I think I think there um, the odd is a distinct moment in this activity. So the the way the way I'm thinking about this this activity is uh, generating the odd that it's striving after. Okay, and the fact that this activity um, is uh, it exists or something right um, does not mean that odd is also going to be realized in its fullest sense. Okay. Um, so I, I, I definitely, like, I, I don't want to separate them insofar as, like, you could have the activity without the ought either, right? So I, I'm clearly prioritizing the activity. Um, but the activity, as you say, is purposive towards this internal concept of a thing, if you like. Um, so, um, so that's how I'm thinking of that, of that relation. I don't know if, if that's... If, if, that's not helpful. Well, is there time for follow up? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I think it is because, yeah, you don't want to have like such a strong separation, but somehow I thought, okay, if it's a activity, then it's maybe the art that gets the activity going in a way. Uh, I think the activity is already in existence, right? Um, and so it's only, and this is sort of why I'm trying to think through this, this worst state example. Um, there the ought uh, is, is not realized in its, in, at least in its completion or fullest extent, right? But the state exists. Like there is this element of like, act, like existence um, that uh, some, to some extent, as I said, the, the concept of the state is realized as actual is in existence. Um, and that's a kind of fulfillment, maybe a partial one. Um, but that, that is why there's a kind of, in my reading, a priority of the activity before um, uh, the, f the, like the full completion. These things are, uh, uh, my language might not be precise enough, um, but the, the full completion of the, the ought that this, this activity is striving towards. Um, Thanks. Yeah. Thank, thank, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. I think the other question. Thanks also for your talk. See how I hope that's pronounced correctly. Um, and I was wondering on your account or what would you would you think that the logic or the status of the concept of the logic um, that the logic is a priori or not? Because if, if like. To say that the logic or the logical structures are a priori would suggest maybe a stronger separation than you made. That's why I asked. Okay, thanks for your question. Uh, 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 can you hear me? Because I, I suddenly I cannot uh, see, see the picture in a full screen. So it, it, everything is all right, right? Okay. 
Okay, thank you. Um, well, uh, the question whether it is a priori, firstly, I would like to point out that if you introduce this uh, notion of being a priori, then uh, I wonder if it is it already means that you're considering it in contrast to what is a posteriori. Because uh, as we know, um, in Kant's uh, introduction, well, maybe not introduction, but uh, um, his usage of such a uh, contrasting uh, conceptions, um, Kant is, uh, well, we can say for Kant, the separation of the subject and object, the thing in itself and the thing as it appears to us is uh, first and foremost his foundation for his whole philosophy. Whereas for Hegel, this is not the case. So from the very start, the path division between the a priori and a posteriori might already be well, questioned by Hegel's logic. Well, to say question, maybe it's better to say that um, Hegel's way of doing the logic would prove that there is not really a, that distinction between a, a priori and the a posteriori. So when you ask whether mm, the logic is a priori, I think the Hegelian answer would be, it is a priori and uh, it, the moment it, you grasp it as the a priori, it proves to be a posteriori, and <laughs> it is also a posteriori only, only in the sense that it is a priori. I, I know it sounds very confusing, but I think the uh, key I want to point out is that um, if you assume a division between the concept on the one hand and the natural existence or its uh, content is feeling on the other hand, then uh, well, it will, well, for Hegel, it would be only a, this is only a one-sided conception of the relation between the concept and the B. And Hegel's logic exactly to proves to, uh, to, to deprives uh, the validity of such one-sided notion of both concept and B. Mm. So in conclusion, I would say um, uh, the, uh, for Hegel, the logical concept is a, a priori, but only in the sense that it is always has a content, and mm, in that sense, it cannot it cannot say that uh, it is not a posterior. I don't know whether uh, this uh, really answers your question. Okay, wonderful. Uh, thank you very much. Our next question is from Stephen. Okay, hello. Um, thank you both very much for your talks, both of which I enjoyed greatly. If I'm permitted, I've got a brief question for uh, each of you. Um, well, actually, it's a how really to you. It's, it's, it's more of a suggestion. Um, first of all, I thoroughly enjoyed that. I, and I, I agree very much with, with the, the line you're presenting. I thought the, the idea that, that, that nature has its own imminence for which um, the logic, if you like, provides a structure, but but um, uh, but which is not exhausted by that logical structure. I thought that was very good, and I think you're right to highlight the moment of externality. Uh, I guess my suggestion is, and what I'd like you to respond to, is the following thought: that that evidence for the fact that externality plays an important role uh, in life in nature is found in the fact that life in nature. For Hegel includes not just animal life, but plant life, and controversially, the life of the earth. Now, we, maybe we leave that outside, but, um, but to take plant life, um, one of the things that distinguishes plants, according to Hegel, is that they, they grow and develop by precisely becoming external to themselves. Um, and, and one of the things that makes them different from animals is that they are not, well, for a start, they're determined by what's external, i.e. by the light, much more than being self-determining, whereas animals are much more self-determining. Plants are determined by um, their situation and by the light, and so they move to follow the light, but also they, they grow by, by adding bits to themselves, so they become self-external. Um, so this just seems to me one suggestion that you could, you could look at, because that doesn't seem to be obviously accounted for in the logic of life. But it does seem to arise if you put the logic of life in the context of the externality of, of, of nature. So 
anyway, that's just one possibility. But I don't have any critical questions because I thought it was very compelling what you had to say. Um, uh, Ryan, um, uh, again, I very enjoyable, very clear. Um, and I agree with you very much on one point, but I, I want to disagree with you on something else. <laughs> um, the idea that, uh, well, I'm going to say the idea rather than the good, realizes itself to some degree, I think is spot on. I, I, I agree with that absolutely. Um, um, but it seems to me that there are different, the reason I would give for explaining that is somewhat different from the one you give. And I suppose the first thing I would want to um, suggest is the following, that in that section on, on the idea of the good, when the good comes to the point of actualizing itself, one could argue that it stops being the good and it becomes the idea. So that what actually actualizes itself is, is not so much the good, but the idea. And it's interesting that when you then talked about the state, you invoke the ideas of the good and the ought. But Hegel doesn't say that. He talks about the concept of the state or the idea of the state. So that seems to be, again, evidence for the fact that it's not that the good is lost, but that the good, when it actualizes itself, no longer takes the form of the good, it comes to be the idea. Um, now, the idea as such, in its logical form, yes, is, is, is self-realizing, um, self-determining. But of course, in the context of nature and the contingencies of history, I think you're absolutely right. The idea realizes itself more or less to some degree. And Hegel does talk about bad states. And in fact, if you compare the state of the philosophy of right, with the historical states he talks about in the philosophy of history, none of those historical states matches the idea of the state. So by Hegel's own logic, the contingencies of history, which are necessary to history, mean that the idea of the state realizes itself imperfectly, and that's a necessity. Um, so I wonder what you think about that. Um, and I want to suggest that as an alternative to the thought of the good realizing itself in its striving, because that does seem, you know, obviously, somewhat Fichtean. Um, and it also assumes that imperfect states are indeed striving <laughs> to realize their good. And it's not clear that they are. You know, I mean, Hegel says some rude things about, about England, about not having a developed enough sense of right. And it's not clear that the English are trying to get that sense of right. Um, they just manifest the idea of, of, of the state in an imperfect way. Sorry, there was rather a lot there. But anyway, I wondered if you could respond to that. So I don't know who wants to go first. So, Howard, you can go Thank ahead if you want, if we want to keep the order. Uh, yeah, maybe I can go first because um, for mine, it's uh, only a suggestion, not a, uh, a question. So I'll give a brief response to that suggestion. And the reason why I didn't uh, in, um, talk much about the plant life, but rather the animal organism, organics, is that I kind of want to, uh, well, distinguish what is not really uh, distinctive uh, at that moment of the philosophy of nature as from the uh, corresponding counterpart in the uh, logic, exactly because that animal organics part um, looks very similar to the logic, but I want to point out that even as similar as that, it still bears the, uh, well, the uh, trace of externality and which uh, might highlight on, uh, which may give rise to uh, uh, the general division, uh, general uh, relation between uh, uh, logic and nature. But yes, if I want to, uh, discuss the uh, specific feature characteristic of the philosophy of nature in general in contrast to logic. I must highlight that externality and uh, your suggestion would be very good in that the uh, structure of a plant and also even as you mentioned the earth in general uh, would displace that uh, specificity of nature uh, more clearly than the animal organism. So yeah, that's a very good uh, suggestion. I would consider it if I'm gonna uh, I'll expand this article in a uh, well, uh, in a lengthy <laughs> extension. Okay, and that's uh, that's my response. And thank you just, for the suggestion. Just one brief follow up. To, yeah, yeah, good. Uh, just one follow. -up. I suppose another way of 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 suggest of another way of understanding what I was trying to get at is is to formulate as a question: Why is it that life in nature? takes the form of plant as well as animal life. Whereas the idea of life just seem, just looks rather like a prefiguring of animal life. 
that might be one way of formulating as a, as a problem. What is it about life in, in, in nature that makes plant life necessary? Um, yeah. and, and how does that not appear in the logic? And that might then open up space for thinking about some of the things you're thinking about. So, um, a very good point. That formulation sounds a, a much deeper. So, yeah, yeah, I'll think about that. Thank you very much. Good. Okay. And thank you, Ryan, your turn. <laughs> Thank you. And yeah, thanks very much, Professor Hulgate, for, for the comments and questions. Very, very helpful, extremely interesting. I, so, uh, I basically agree with the first point, okay, so that the result of this section is, is uh, the idea, full stop. And that in a way, Hegel's conception of uh, the idea and the absolute idea as the unity of theoretical and practical, like, um, uh, in some ways, he doesn't need to talk about the good anymore. And in fact, he doesn't. Like in the absolute idea section, the closest, he, like what he keeps talking about is truth, right? So, and, and in this section, he keeps saying, well, what the practical lacks is the theoretical, right? And we need to keep, we need to bring truth back. And what we get as a result is um, not the truth of the, the initial shapes of it in, in the beginning of cognition, the truth is some inert given, right? But the truth as this um, unity between concept and reality, or that uh, things in their truth, um, uh, not not merely this empirical uh, account of truth, what obviously he he in other places calls correctness, um, and so I read then Hegel's account of something being in its truth as both um, just that the fulfillment of its concept, um, but. And also something, there is still something uh, normative on my reading about that, right? And, and because that something can live up to its concept in better and worse ways. Um, and, but I do, I do, I, I, I am in full agreement with you that in some ways his conception of truth means we don't have to uh, frame this in terms of goodness anymore. Like it contains this aspect of the practical. And, and I think there is something telling just to repeat myself that, that he's, he keeps talking about truth and he stops talking about the practical in the section on the absolute idea. Um, and, and then to the related, and I hope uh, this is consistent with what I'm saying there, um, to your example about um, this, how he discusses states and, that, and, and you're right that, that in the example that I went to, um, it is in terms of the, the true state right, and, and the state as idea. Uh, he doesn't use the language of goodness there, um, but he does call it the worst state, right? And so there is some sort of measure, uh, and, and I, I'm making a minimal claim, like I, I'm fine with dropping this, this language of the good, but there is some measure of what something is in its truth, and this state can fail to, um, to live up to it, or it can, right? So, so I, I'm happy that, that there's some agreement we have between this uh, thought that things live up uh, to the concept to some extent. Um, and that's, I, I'm not trying to say much more than that or, or to cling too tightly to the language of the good. I, I, I think there is something you know, negated in the, in the actually getting rid of sense of, of, of this term. And, and obviously he's critical you know, he sets it up as, as an ought, right? And then that, those presuppositions have to be, have to be um, um, developed into, you know, the leaving behind of them. Um, so, so I'll stop there, but, but I, I, I think we, uh, we, we don't have huge disagreements here on. Good, thank you. Just, uh, thank you very much. Just one quick brief follow-up comment that, that might help uh, resolve what, what minimal difference there is between us perhaps. Would it be very odd if one said that, 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 yes, the idea of a state is normative, but for Hegel, the normative is not equal to the ought. The yeah. normative, the idea of the state is what it is to be a state, the true nature of a state. But that's very different from what the state ought to be. And so not all normativity for Hegel consists in a set of oughts. Now, I think if that's the case, then you can keep the idea of a measure or a norm, even though I've only found one place in Hegel where he uses that term. Yeah, um, yeah. You can keep that without introducing this rather problematic idea of, of what the state ought to be. Um, and so maybe that's the way to, uh, to resolve it. But um, I'll, I'll... I, I think you're right. I think that's, that's probably the road to go that's much, much cleaner. I just, 
I'll, I'm never sure how to respond to someone who then says, well, isn't it the case that the state ought to be the true state or something like that? And there, I'm like, I would say something like, sure, but we still don't need this language of the ought that has too much baggage, et cetera. Yeah. Um, um, but I, I'm with you. There is no, when I use, and I, I, yeah, there's probably a better way of discussing this without these terms like norms that, that Hegel doesn't use a great deal or more than once. Um, um, this can all be done with terms like the idea and, and the true, and, that, and there's nothing more to the good than that on my reading. Um, and, and I think that seems to, to thank you. be how it works a lot. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. Okay, thank you very much, everyone, for your questions. Uh, we're now going to take a longer break, a half an hour break, and we'll be back at 4.30 UK time for Bridget Falkenberg's talk, The Logic of Nature. Thank you once more to our speakers.